Hello everyone, Frozen Foxy here. I uh, earlier listened to Catronana's reading on her stream, and uh, I have to say that uh, I was slightly inspired by it, and uh, felt as if maybe I should do some sort of uh, reading myself. I don't know. It might turn out badly, but yeah, she had read um, Clive Barker's Dread, uh, some sort of Jack the Ripper story, which I had missed, so I can't tell you exactly what that was. And uh, she was also reading H.P. Lovecraft's Shadow Over Innsmouth. And uh, if you've read my interests, I absolutely adore H.P. Lovecraft. So, um... Personally, I felt like I had to perhaps read something from H.P. Lovecraft since I was slightly inspired by what uh, Catherine Honest was doing. So, um, tell me if you like this. Tell me if you don't like this. I, I would like to hear from the viewers because this might be my first and only let's read if the viewers don't like it. But, um... If you do like it, then uh, maybe I'll do another one. Who knows? So, for tonight, let's read The Call of Cthulhu by H.P. Lovecraft with Frozen Foxy as your reader tonight. Of such great powers or beings, there may conceivably be a survival a survival of hugely remote period when consciousness was manifested, perhaps in shapes and forms long since withdrawn before the tide of advancing humanity, forms of which poetry and legend alone have caught a flying memory and called them gods, monsters, mythical beings of all sorts and kinds. This quote from Algernon Blackwood. Chapter 1 of The Call of Cthulhu, The Horror in Clay. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little, but some day the piercing together of dissociated knowledge will open such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. Theosophists have guessed at the awesome grandeur of the cosmic cycle wherein our world and human race form transient incidents. They have hinted at strange survivals in terms which would freeze the blood if not masked by bland optimism. But it is not from them that there came the single glimpse of forbidden eons, which chills me when I think of it, and maddens me when I dream of it. That glimpse, like all dread glimpses of truth, flashed out from an accidental piecing together of separated things. In this case, an old newspaper item, and the notes of a dead professor. I hope that no one else will accomplish this piecing out. Certainly, if 
I live, I shall never knowingly supply a link in so hideous a chain. I think that the professor, too, intended to keep silent regarding the part he knew, and that he would have destroyed his notes had not sudden death seized him. My knowledge of the thing began in the winter of 1926, perhaps going into 1927, with the death of my great-uncle, George Gamel Engel, Professor Emeritus of Semitic Languages in Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island. Professor Engel was widely known as an authority on ancient inscriptions and had frequently been resorted to by the heads of prominent museums so that his passing at the age of 92 may be recalled by many. Locally, interest was intensified by the obscurity of the cause of death. The professor had been stricken whilst returning from the Newport boat, falling suddenly, as witnesses said, after having been jostled by a nautical-looking negro who had come from one of the queer dark courts on the Prispus hillside, which formed a shortcut from the waterfront to the deceased's homes in William Street. Physicians were unable to find any visible disorder, but concluded after perplexed debate that some obscure lesion of the heart, induced by the brisk ascent of so steep a hill by so elderly a man, was responsible for the end. At the time, I saw no reason to dissent from this dictum, but... Latterly, I am inclined to wonder, and more than wonder. As my great-uncle's heir and executioner, for he died a childless widower, I was expected to go over his papers with some thoroughness, and for that purpose moved his entire set of files and boxes to my quarters in Boston. Much of the material which I correlated will be later published by the American Archaeological Society, but there was one box which I found exceedingly puzzling, and which I felt much adverse from showing to other eyes. It had been locked, and I did not find the key till it occurred to me to examine the personal ring which the professor carried in his pocket. Then, indeed, I succeeded in opening it, but when I did, so it, it seemed only to be confronted by greater and more closely locked barrier. For what could be the meaning of the queer clay bass relief and the disjointed jottings, ramblings, and cuttings which I found? Had my uncle in his latter years become credulous? of the most superficial impostures. I resolved to search out the eccentric sculpture responsible for this apparent disturbance of an old man's peace of mind. The bas relief was a rough rectangle less than an inch thick and about five by six inches in area obviously of modern origin. Its designs, however, were far from modern in atmosphere and suggestion. 
for although the the vagarities of cubism and futurism are many and wild, they do not often reproduce that cryptic regularity which lurks in prehistoric writing.